The Devil's Footprints is a mystery we have covered prior on this channel, way back on part 13 of the Mega Series, and I won't go in depth on it again, since you probably already know what mystery I am referring to. But basically, in February of 1855, in South Devon, England, residents would wake up after a night of heavy snowfall to find these bizarre footprints. The seemingly went from 40 to 100 miles, and in some accounts, even traversed over roofs. They were often described as cloven hoof, like that of a deer, which led to a theory at the time, or maybe a silly superstition, that these hooves were from Satan, who had apparently ran up and down the countryside this snowy night for some reason. There were also more down-to-earth theories, like hopping mice, or badgers, or maybe even an experimental air balloon that broke away and was dragging its chain across the snow. But there was one theory we didn't discuss then that is now the focus of this iceberg. That is, the theory that it was actually a kangaroo. This was actually one of the first theories proposed, as a letter sent into the Illustrated London News shortly after, from a Reverend G. M. Musgrave, would read, In the course of a few days, a report was circulated that a couple of kangaroos escaped from a private zoo in Sidmouth. However, Musgrave was ridiculed for this, and many questioned how the kangaroos had escaped and how they ever crossed the ex estuary. It was then that Reverend Musgrave would backpedal and admit he made the whole thing up, citing the people at his church were so worried about the devil leaving the tracks that many of them would not even leave their home after sunset. So it was his way to alleviate some of the worry. Other things going against this theory was the obstacles traversed by the devil's footprints, such as high walls and rooftops, which a kangaroo could not clear. There's also the issue of the footprints themselves. Kangaroo prints are significantly different than hoof-like marks that were documented, as well as a bouncing of a kangaroo would go much further than the span of the devil's footprints. As far as other proof for the kangaroo theory, I could not find any, other than the Reverend's claims. So unless he knew for a fact that it was a kangaroo and only backpedaled out of embarrassment, this one is pretty much a dead theory. September 6th, 2023, a producer slash actor, Emerson Collins, would board a flight on American Airlines and would have one of the weirdest experiences you could possibly conceive of, as right before takeoff, a mysterious voice would come over the in-flight announce system and make noises of grunting, moaning, and groaning, and would continue to do so during the flight, as you can see here. After a few moments of this, the airline attendant would then come over the intercom stating that the crew was trying to run down the source of the sounds. And if you're thinking, hey, that's strange, but this guy's an actor and a producer, and he would have an easy enough time doctoring the footage to make it appear that this sound is actually coming from the intercom. Well, that would be a possibility, if not for the fact that several other people also reported this happening as well, because the following accounts are just a few from various online sources. One, a John NYC, would post that he believed someone had hacked into the PA and was making moaning and screaming sounds. Another man, Bradley P. Allen, would claim that he heard moans of someone in extreme pain, noting that it happened three to four times during the flight, and that the crew told them that it had happened before, but they had no idea why. Another person would tell about the flight he was on where the sounds went on the entire flight and the crew's tireless task in trying to stop it, and that even when landing, the crew still could not find the problem. Another passenger would note that they heard periodic weird phrases and sounds, and even heard a huge, oh yeah, when the plane landed. They at first thought that the pilot accidentally left his mic on, and eventually, two of the people that had these experiences on different flights would even connect online and share audio to which they both confirmed was the same voice on each flight. But what did the actual airline say about this? Their official response was underwhelming, to say the least. Their excuse was that it was mechanical issues with the PA amplifier, which raises the volume in their PA system when the engines are running. They also stated 
that their PA systems are hardwired with no external access and no Wi-Fi component, thus making them incredibly difficult to hack. They stated they were reviewing additional reports but would not comment on how many they had received, which begs the question, how can an amplifier malfunction to the point of broadcasting what sounds like a human voice without any external access on different flights and different aircraft? In spite of everyone stating that it sounded human, the airline insisted that it was an artificial noise. But it gets stranger because a professional security analyst slash hardware hacker, Andrew Tierney, would get access to Airbus 321 documents and began studying. He finally conceded that he could not find a path for the system to be hacked. He did note that you could speak on the interphone over the PA systems from weird places like the belly of the plane where luggage is stored. However, it's still a wired connection. He would conclude by stating he was struggling to see how anyone pulled off a prank like this. But was it a prank? And were the airlines covering it up? Most likely not, because one report by an aviation watchdog would find an internal American Airlines message board which discussed the weirdness. One thread there was even found asking if someone could explain what was going on because she was starting to think the flight was haunted. She recounted that the pilots had called the flight attendants to ask them if they were trying to get a hold of the pilots because someone was calling and breathing into the interphone. And of course, it was not any of these attendants. Soon, all the phones began to ring at the same time, and when they answered them, it was just a tone sound. Then, breathing noise came over the PA, and it was very loud. It continued throughout most of the flight before switching to a groaning, moaning, guttural throat sound like that of a horror film. The passengers, as well as the crew, were starting to get a little bit nervous. So, what is actually going on here? One of the early theories was that of the PRAM, which stands for pre-recorded announcement machine. These are recorded announcements for the flight that state things like boarding, door closed, 10,000 feet, etc, etc. And that audio is less than 20 minutes and is queued up to play during the flight and are paused when there is an in-flight announcement by the crew. However, these files are uploaded by the technical crew on the ground who get the files from somewhere, presumably by employees who work for the airline. Is it possible whoever recorded these intentionally put the sounds throughout the recording just to troll people? That doesn't seem likely since some people reported hearing the sounds near the end of the flight and the recordings are supposed to be less than 20 minutes. However, some believe the reason offered up by the airline that it is in fact just artificial noise or audio feedback filtered through the announce systems. Others still disagree, citing the sounds seem too purposeful to be random and could be a prank or maybe even paranormal activity. In the time creating content for this channel, we have covered several cryptid topics and cryptozoology as a whole is mired in controversy as many skeptics and scholars cite that it's nothing more than a pseudoscience. However, cryptozoology by definition is the study of unknown, legendary, or extinct animals. And since new animals are discovered every year, it gives a little wiggle room for cryptid proponents, since some of these sightings could very well be animals that just haven't been documented yet. But our next mystery actually tackles the other part of that definition, the study of extinct, never documented animals. Because one obscure cryptid theory states that some of these undocumented animals, particularly those from the megafauna field, which consist of large animals like that of elephants, giraffes, hippopotamuses, rhinoceroses, and buffalo slash cattle, etc. Actually, had several species that went extinct early in the 20th century, when mass industrialization caused these animals to lose their habitat or die from pollution. The theory basically states that these large animals in the late 1800s and early 1900s were severely endangered and quickly disappearing but were sighted and described several times only to go extinct shortly afterwards before they could be officially catalogued. A prime example of this theory is Cabminhoco, which is a cryptid that was reported to have lived in southern Brazil and maybe Uruguay, Nicaragua, and Bolivia. It was said to be a serpentine or worm-like creature with hard black scales and horns 
that lived underground, where its tunneling caused much destruction. According to the accounts of people who actually seen it, it was around 3 foot thick and 80 feet long, and the tunnels it left was 3 to 10 feet wide. It had a pig-like snout, thick bony armored scales, and movable horns on its head. It had no legs, and the old accounts cited that it resembled earthworms more than anything else, except it had a visible mouth, while the later sightings compared it more to a snake. It was also amphibious and preyed on livestock, which it would pull down beneath the water. It also had a loud roar, which could be heard from far away, but the description of the creature is not actually that important to us. It's the documented sightings. It was first reported in the 1840s and was reported up until around 1900 when the sightings completely stopped. One of these earliest accounts came from Paraguay when a Labino Jose dos Santos, who was traveling through the area, heard stories from the locals that a minoco had caught itself in a narrow cleft of rock and died. Later that year, the area would be hit with a period of rains, and as Yuval J. Duos heard what he thought was rain, although the sky was clear and sunny. So the next morning, when he went out, he found a piece of land on the other side of a hill where a wide tunnel had been dug that showed a creature had went through the area and then entered into a stream. It would be three years later that Lobino Jose dos Santos would go through to search this area and found the tunnel still there. He documented them as being made by two animals that were between six and 10 feet thick. Moving to the 1860s, we would have one of the most prominent figures in the Santa Catarina area of Brazil, a man named Emil Oderbrecht, an engineer slash cartographer who immigrated from Germany, where he would be instrumental on opening roads and demarcating lots leading to the development of several cities. He was one of the first Europeans to pass through several regions of the area, and it's him that would report in the uplands of Santa Catarina that his progress was impeded on a swampy plain by a series of trenches that ran along a stream. The trenches were too wide to step across, leaving him to have to jump over them. There would be several other sightings between 1860 and 1899, but we don't need to explore every one of those, because a mystery is not if the Minoko was real. It was just an example of this obscure theory, which brings us back to, is it possible that several megafauna sightings documented in this time period were animals on the brink of extinction and were never scientifically cataloged, leading to the animal becoming known as a cryptid. Well, of course, the argument against this one is, there have been several extinct animals from long, long ago, like dinosaurs, where evidence was found of their existence, yet animals just over a century ago that have went extinct supposedly left no remains that have been found, which is hard to believe. Of course, the counter-argument to that is, it's estimated that we still haven't found 86% of the species that are currently living. So just imagine how many have been lost to time. May 2005, the seaside town of Litham St. Anne's in Lancashire, England, would get their own strange cryptid mystery when an animal known as the Beast of Green Drive started being spotted by a number of residents. Litham is one of the nicer places to live in this area, and Green Drive is a private road that runs close to the edge of town, where it crosses farms and dense woodlands before finishing at Green Drive Golf Club. This so-called cryptid was described as being about the size of a border collie, but had large ears, pale fur, and a strange and large mouth, and moved by making unusually large strides. One of the first accounts came from a woman named Sandra Sturick, who, while out walking her dog, would come across the strange cryptid that she stated had large ears sticking straight up. It calmly watched her and her dog, which prompted her to put the leash back on. She then took a step forward to get a better look, and the creature turned around and dashed off into the dense forest. Her dog then went to the area where the creature had stood and sniffed around like crazy. This would be followed shortly later by a man named William Davidson, who, while outside, heard a snarl behind him, and he turned around to see the same creature. The story soon went viral all over the country, and led to more and more witnesses coming forward with their own strange encounter stories. One woman would claim she had seen the dog too, and said it looked similar to both dog and rabbit. 
More than 20 sightings in total were reported, leading to a frenzy. The police actually checked local zoos and farms and found out there had been no animals missing that could account for the sightings. So what exactly, if any theory, could explain this cryptid? Well, there are basically two. One is that the animal was actually a muntjac deer. The animal is native to Southeast Asia, but someone imported a herd years ago to the grounds of nearby Litham Hall, and it is possible a small population of that herd escaped where it survived until modern day. There was also some that were imported to southern England in the early 1900s, which then apparently escaped at one point and became known as an invasive species. However, it's thought they wouldn't have been able to spread that far up north by this time. The second theory was that it was nothing more than a fox that had a bad case of mange. In fact, just two years after the original sightings, which lasted all of one month in 2005, the sightings would begin again in 2007. And this time, a fox with mange was found in a woman's home, where it was then captured by the Royal Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals. Unfortunately, the vet recommended due to its condition and age should be put to sleep. Although this fox was old enough to be around in 2005, if it had mange that severe back then, it would not have survived until 2007, most likely ruling out this theory. Hans Holzer is a name you may have never heard of, but if you're into the paranormal, you should definitely know. Holzer was a parapsychologist who wrote more than 120 books on the supernatural and occult. He was involved in numerous paranormal investigations throughout his career, which started in 1963 and spanned over four decades. In some aspects, you may call him the first modern-day ghost hunter, and it's his account in the 1966 book Yankee Ghost that brings us our next mystery. The story involves a three-story brick house locked in the Greenwich Village of New York City, where some pretty well-known and influential people live. Now, Holzer had been invited to the house by the occupants of Frank Paris and Ted Lewis, and it was here that Holzer brought along a woman with him named Betty Ritter. Now, Betty was a medium who allegedly could communicate with ghosts, and because of this reason, he made sure to keep Betty out of the interviews with the house's occupants because he did not want her to be influenced by their details. In addition, the two men in the home invited an older lady, Alice Hall, who had been witness to some of the strange events. According to their account, the home was purchased in 1956, and since they had moved in, a number of weird things had happened. For example, one night, when working late in the basement, which they had converted into a workshop, Frank would begin to smell the strong odor of violets, to which their dog also responded as if he smelled them as well, while Ted would claim he smelled nothing out of the ordinary. Another odd thing of the home was Frank reported to hear people walking up and down the stairs all night long, to which they would both go investigate and could never find a source for. Apparently, both men had also left on a town trip at one point, and the friend of the house who sent for them asked upon their return who the people were going up and down the stairs all night. The house sitter had actually even thought the noise may be coming from the house next door, which is later determined had not been. Then we bring in the older lady, Alice Hall, who explained during her visit just two months earlier that she had been sitting in the living room when she looked towards the entrance to see an unrecognized man standing there. He had dark hair and was wearing evening clothes with a weatherproof outer coat. It was around dusk at this time and she would turn around to Frank and tell him he had a visitor, and when they both turned back to look, he had vanished. Frank wrote this off at first, until a week later, when he would see the man. He would claim the man's face was obscured by the shadows of the hallway, as well as the outer coat, which hung down like a cape. He also noted he was wearing a hat at this time, but both of them cited his young appearance and sparkling eyes. Even stranger was apparently the dog had even walked up to this spirit. Hoser, now satisfied after hearing their accounts, brought the medium back into the house to get her impression on the home. She claimed she could sense that a crime had been committed in the home, which had been connected to a terrible argument between two people upstairs. She also felt the sense of a gambling den, opium smokers, and speaking in a language she could not understand, and felt that the home was connected with a man named Ming. 
But Betty was not finished. Once she reached the basement, she began to act possessed, mumbling the name Emil twice. She claimed that a woman had been decapitated in the home and her bones were still there somewhere. She then went upstairs where she claimed she saw documents with government seals and felt that a woman named Mary Ellen had lived in the home before. And before that, a well-known government official named Wilkins or Wilkinson. And while not all of her claims were right, I have to note here, Betty was right about two of these things. As the two men had purchased the home from a woman named Mary Ellen Strunsky, who was a real estate broker, as well as being right about the person who had lived there before her, a well-known government official who was the former mayor of New York, Jimmy Walker, whose last name obviously started with a W like Wilkins or Wilkinson. And he was a very well-known politician as his time in office was noted with a lot of corruption. After this, Holzer would wrap up his investigation and it would actually be nine years later that this story would get truly bizarre and interesting. On July 5th of 1975, a staff writer named Will Murray, who worked for a small press magazine, had the good fortune of interviewing author Walter Gibson at the New York Comic Art Convention. Gibson, known at the time as Maxwell Grant, had written over 280 pulp novels featuring the fictional detective The Shadow, a character that had debuted nine years before Batman and was a big influence to the early comics. Now Gibson was 79 years old at this point, but still had a good memory. And it was in this interview that he would bring up the so-called haunted home in Greenwich Village that Hans Holzer had researched about almost a decade before. How they got on this topic, I do not know. But Gibson would state that he had lived in that apartment before the haunted investigation took place and would bring up the claims of people seeing a man in evening clothes and an overcoat and hat moving in and out of the apartment, and stated that crazily that apartment was where he wrote his very last issue of The Shadow, and that what the occupants of the home were really seeing was The Shadow, or, more specifically, his secret identity, Lamont Cranston. Yes, according to Gibson, what Frank Paris and Alice Hall had really seen in the home was called an after-image psychic projection, not some silly ghost. Bet you didn't see that one coming. So basically, Gibson was claiming that the ghost was just a figment of his imagination that must have remained in the home and was later seen by the residents. Gibson would go on to state he did not believe in ghosts at all, but did believe in psychic powers. And that's why he believed this was due to some sort of psychic projection. He claimed the way that Frank and Alice described the person was exactly the same features the shadow had, shining eyes and all. This is where the topa portion of this mystery comes in, which, if you're not familiar with that concept, it's where a being can be created by the concentrated focus of an individual, and that Gibson's focus led to the shadow topa, which now lived in that building. Of course, that leaves out the other parts of the claims, like the smell of violets, and people walking up and down the steps all night, and why there were only two sightings of this topa. Furthermore, Gibson was telling the story nine years after the account of the house being haunted become well known, so he could just be making it up, right? And that's when we bring in John Keel, the well-known author of The Mothman Prophecies, which covered many strange events. In it, he would write about this haunted house, as well as Gibson's claim that it was the Shadow Tulpa, and this book, well, it actually came out before the interview Gibson done with the magazine, meaning that this story had to be older than the interview, suggesting that maybe it was known in some circles for years. So a bit of a convoluted story, and I'm curious what you all think. Was it a ghost, or a topa created by Gibson, or maybe neither of those? February 18th, 2023, Surrey, British Columbia, Canada. Residents near the L.A. Matheson Secondary School would be in for a very strange sight. Around 1 p.m., footage would be shot of what appeared to be a dead bird just floating in the air. No strings, nothing, but yet it sat there in place. The video would move around to show there was nothing that the bird could be attached to or perched on. The person behind the camera would then zoom in to see the bird sway lightly in the wind, but never flinched or moved. He then walked under it 
to see if anything was attached, paying special attention to the power lines, but again, did not see anything. It was, for lack of better description, a dead bird frozen in the air. By 4.30 p.m., one of the residents who had seen it earlier would return to find the bird was gone. So what is up with this strange video? Well, there are a few theories. For one, it suggested that because of the proximity of trees and telegraph wires, that there is something holding the bird up that the human eye cannot see. In all likelihood, fishing line. One bird expert would even state that the bird had likely gotten tangled in fishing line, where it then got tangled on something and left it suspended until it died. The power company would also chime in, stating there was nothing in the power lines that could have caused this anomaly. Of course, you get the more out there theories, like it was an elaborate hoax by an illusionist, or perhaps even a glitch in the Matrix. Nolan Reservoir in Edmondson County, Kentucky was built by the United States Army Corps of Engineers in 1963 as part of the Flood Control Act. The lake varies from 3,000 to 6,000 acres depending on the time of the year, and it's this lake that plays home to our next mystery. In an article taken from the Courier Journal in Louisville on March 28, 1979, we would find a story that had taken place on the lake just a few years before. According to the Army Corps of Engineer officials, patrols were out on the water when they came across an interesting find. They would spot a large log floating about on the lake. Curious, they got closer, and what they thought was a log was actually the bottom of a large dugout canoe. They would haul it back to land to get a closer look, and they described it as being 20 feet long and almost 3 feet wide at the center, and made completely from a solid piece of timber. Its edges were smooth and evenly rounded at the bottom. It was obvious whoever had built this had spent a great amount of time and effort in doing so. Regulations stated that property found floating in the lake had to be held by the Corps of Engineers for at least 120 days to allow time for the owners to come and claim it, and this would be done. However, nobody came by to collect, although one man would try to claim that his children had found it the year before and played with it in the lake so he wanted to now claim ownership. This was denied, however. The canoe was then looked at by the University of Louisville archaeologist Phil de Blasi, who had only seen one other like it in his career, and that one was in Cleveland, where it had been dug out of a swamp in the area. He stated that the one found floating in Nolan Reservoir could date back to 400 or 500 AD. Another professor would come in, this time from the University of Tennessee, and he would study a sample of the wood which looked very similar to one of two types of trees found only in Central and South America, which is definitely strange as one would not think that the natives from Central or South America would have been traveling as far north as Kentucky. However, the Army Corps Area Resource Manager disputed that, as well as disputing the claim that it was built around 400 AD, and instead believed the craft was built from an American chestnut a tree that was almost extinct by the 1930s. He theorized it was built by the early settlers, or Native Americans, and abandoned in one of the many caves in the area, which was then washed out after the Corps raised the water of the lake, which flooded the caves, causing the canoe to become dislodged and floated out. Archaeologists would then go on to state that carbon dating probably wouldn't work, but there would be a method of tree ring dating that could be tried to find the age of the craft. However, I was not able to find a follow-up to this story, so we're left to wonder, where does this canoe come from, and when was it built? September 30th, 1883, the Salt Lake Herald would pin a very bizarre tale that centered around three men, Messer Rosengay, Alan Vandal, and Edward Strong who had been traveling between Florida, Alabama, and Mississippi, inspecting pine lands. They, according to them, worked for a company that had been formed in Minnesota for the sole purpose of buying land in the south that contained a lot of trees, which the company would then build numerous sawmills to start the production of lumber to be sold in Mexico. These were men of modest means and had made several friends along their way through the countryside, but what happened to them next 
between St. Tammany and Washington Parishes in Louisiana would make this one of the strangest stories we've ever covered. The men had went there because they had heard of some desirable land in between the two parishes, and the men had made accommodations to stay at a farmhouse they had found nearby, and after the first day of inspecting the area, they decided to go home around 4 p.m., but Alan Vandal had gotten tired of riding and stopped to walk and take notes while the other men led his horse. Vandal would then make his way ahead and off the path taking notes as he went, and before long, he was out of sight. But a few minutes later, the other two men, Messrs and Edward, would see Vandal come around a bend straight towards them on a dead run. The men rode faster towards him to see what was wrong. When they stopped, Vandal, almost out of breath, would tell them to tie up their horses and go up the road with him because there was the greatest sight they will ever see. So the men did just that and began walking up the road. And about 300 yards later, he put his finger up to his lips to motion them to be quiet. They then crept through the undergrowth on the side of the road. The men then heard a deep, coarse laugh from just a short distance away. It was human, but hollow and unearthly, and sent a chill up their spine. The laughing continued, and the men soon identified it as female. Stunned, the men stood quiet. Vandal then motioned for them to creep in, which they did, about 30 yards to the edge of a thicket. It was here, in an open space, just a few yards away, they would spot something truly unexplainable. Sitting on the trunk of a fallen tree was a shabby looking figure they believed to be a woman. Her clothing was torn to rags and her hair hung to her shoulders in a tangled mess. She was about 60 years old and dark from long exposure to the sun and weather, but it's what was near her that was truly unexplainable. There were these three hideous beings as the men could not describe them as human. They were apparently playing and she was watching them attentively. Their heads were shaped like humans when it came to their ears, eyes, and neck, but their mouth and nose came together broad and thick like a bear. Their arms resembled men, but from the waist down was the shape of a bear, including the feet, which had immense claws. The men would watch the creatures silently as they wrestled and played and danced. They would even move from biped to all fours. The men continued to watch until one of them slightly changed his position, partially entering their view while at the same time making a slight noise. This got the woman's attention and she cried out in alarm and went through the undergrowth on the other side opening with the speed of a deer, followed by the three bear-like humans running on all fours. The men strangely tried to follow them but could not find their trail, forcing them to give up and return. They would come back the next day where they scoured the area looking for them again but did not find one clue and the Werebear family would never be seen again. As far as theories, this is a strange one. Although, the most likely scenario is that the newspaper made up the whole account to boost sales or the men were pulling off a hoax or, hey, maybe it really happened. In 2020, police in France would begin investigating a particularly gruesome and barbaric set of crimes that to this day have not been solved, maybe. Around August of that year, reports were made to the police about mutilations of at least 30 horses in different areas. One happened in the Jura region and involved a horse being stunned before an eye was gouged out and a piece of bone removed, which led to the horse dying. Another instance was a horse that had died of natural causes and the owner was waiting to have it professionally removed would soon find out that his horse had its ear, eye, and nose removed sometime while the owner was away. Another owner in Burgundy would find that his horse had its right ear cut off, one of its eyes gouged out, and genitals removed. Donkeys were not spared in the attacks either. This of course upset many people from animal lovers to horse owners and breeders. And soon, a social media campaign was started, which put pressure on the police. But this did little to slow the crimes down. A Paris police spokesperson would compare the killings and mutilations to past incidents in Germany and Belgium, which occurred in 2014 and 16. 
but the ones in France way outnumbered those. Police also could not find any specific motives or any pattern related to how the horses were targeted. It would get even crazier when a man named Nicolas de Maison would be attacked on the ranch he ran on August 24, 2020. His attackers were two individuals between 40 and 50, and they had slashed his arm with a pruning knife before fleeing, as well as his horse and two ponies, which were left with significant scars. However, this could never be conclusively linked to all the other horse attacks, and seemed to be more directed at Demejan. There were a few theories, though. Investigators concluded that it may have been done by professionals involved with horses and their handling, and it may have been a way to pull off insurance fraud or for some other financial gain. However, since the attacks were often carried out in a series, it suggested a systematic approach by the culprits, leading to the theory that it could have been a satanic ritual carried out by a cult, or possibly even some internet challenge. People even speculated that the attacks were being coordinated on the dark web. But let's pump the brakes a bit, because after numerous thorough investigations, it seems the most likely scenario was the horses had all died from natural causes, and then the so-called mutilations were the work of scavenging animals, but because of the media and internet, it created a mass panic where more and more people came forward with their reports, not unlike what happened in the States a couple of decades ago with the so-called cattle mutilations. Of course, one other theory states, and I love this one, that numerous UFOs were spotted in the areas where the horse mutilations took place. Our next mystery comes from an account on the phantomsandmonsters.com website, which documents the story of a six-year-old girl named Corinne, who was living in La Puente, California in the early 2000s with her parents and two sisters, whom she shared a bedroom with. She would note that their bedroom had sliding closet doors, which most of the time were not closed all the way, and her bed was situated facing those doors. And it was on this particular night, she would wake up from a dead sleep to glance over and see something that shook her up so bad that even to this day as an adult, she still sleeps with the light on. Because she glanced over and seen an orange glowing man peeking around the door of the closet and looking right at her. He was smiling, but it was a diabolical smile. His fingers clinged to the door frame, where he then poked his head out to look. When she then got a better look, she described him as looking like the Joker from the original Batman series. Even stranger, this clown glowed orange from within. She was so scared, she couldn't even make a sound. Instead, she just turned away and buried her face in the pillow in what felt like forever. Finally, she would look up to see that it was morning, where she quickly got up and went and told her parents about what had happened, who promptly dismissed the whole thing as a bad dream. Corinne would claim that even to this day, she knows it was not a dream. This one is a creepy one. So what gives? There's a few theories on it. The main one seems to be that she was experiencing sleep paralysis and dreamed the whole thing. Of course, you also got the more paranormal theory that states that something was haunting her home and manifested itself into the clown. Paranormal investigators cite that ghosts turning into real physical forms are the least common form of manifestations, but there are accounts of it. Could it be this is what Kareem witnessed that night? And of course, there's numerous accounts of people seeing phantom clowns. Maybe the height of this came in the 80s when a bunch of reports in U.S. cities claimed that clowns were trying to lure or scare children. When the police looked into it, they reported it was nothing more than mass hysteria. Which brings us back to Corinne. Maybe she had not been dreaming. Maybe she didn't have sleep paralysis. But still, just imagine the whole thing. Viktor Gribbenekov was a strange man living in Russia who seemed to really love insects. Viktor was a self-proclaimed scientist, biologist, entomologist, and paranormal researcher, best known for his claim of inventing something that doesn't even seem logical. According to Viktor, he created a levitation platform which operated by attaching dead insect body parts to the underside. Viktor 
would write many detailed accounts about his experiences flying over the Russian countryside on this levitation device, which he did at a high speed to avoid detection. It was also on these flights that he would report his other observations of paranormal phenomena, which usually involved insect nests or parts. As it should probably not be a surprise, Victor's claims of flying on a levitation device made out of insect parts was widely rejected by skeptics, who stated he would not show any proof nor do a public demonstration. He would make a counterclaim that he tried to take a photo during one flight, but the camera shutter was jammed due to a time warping force field generated by the secret geometric power of chitin, which is the major substance that makes up exoskeletons of insects. I try to be open-minded to a lot of these subjects on this iceberg, but this one is incredibly difficult to believe. Although, I will say he had a following in the 90s. Theories are obvious. He made the entire thing up, or it was legit, and the Russian government is hiding the technology. Carl Schuker of West Midlands, England, is a well-known zoologist and cryptozoologist who has written several works on the world of cryptozoology, and in particular, dragons. It was his article in Strange Magazine, where our mystery begins. He would cite a story given to him by an anonymous British naturalist, where him and some of his colleagues were conducting some research in the area of Powys, Wales in March 2001. Apparently, the crew had been notified by a local of something strange that had been seen in the area earlier that year. So the crew went to investigate, and as they stood at the edge of the forest by a quarry, they suddenly spotted something that really shocked them. A creature about two and a half feet in length that looked like a dragon. It had four limbs, but its head was in the shape of a seahorse, and it was airborne. It flew about ten feet high above the surface of the quarry in a wide circle. They did not see any wings, but it had a long tail. He was green and sort of shimmered and they watched it for about three to four minutes at a distance of 50 feet before it flew back into one of the caves of the quarry. What makes this one interesting is folklorist Mary Trevelyan would interview many elderly people living in the Glamorgan area of Wales in the early 19th century who recalled stories from their childhood of winged serpents that lived around the Penling Castle about two and a half hours away that had crested heads and feathery wings and were brightly colored and glistened, similar to the account given in 2001, except these were not identified as dragons. Instead, they were called flying snakes, and many were shot because they were killing livestock in the area. What to make of this one? Well, dragons may be the oldest cryptid type in the world. Accounts of them go back to ancient times and go over practically every culture. It's thought that the origin for this is the ancient people finding dinosaur fossils and then interpreting them to be dragon remains. Likewise, the discovery of a whale carcass washed ashore may have also led ancient people to the same reasoning. But that's ancient people. What about this modern sighting? Well, I couldn't find a lot of theories, but there are a couple of interesting ones. One is that a pterodactyl, which was a flying reptile from the time of the dinosaurs, somehow survived in the royal area in these caves, and that is what the researchers really seen, not a dragon. Of course, that theory is just as far-fetched as a dragon. The other one could be a trick of the mind. Maybe these researchers saw something they couldn't explain and their mind jumped a dragon without any proof. Although, it's more likely this anonymous naturalist just reported his unexplained finding to Carl Schuker, who then immediately jumped a dragon, since that is an area he is very interested in. Likewise, it's possible that Schuker made the whole thing up. Our next mystery comes from the paranormal section of the now defunct about.com, which was a pretty big site in the late 90s. The site had a section where people could email in about their own paranormal experiences, and it's there we would get a strange one from a user known only as JP. In a post from August 2000, he would tell of a story that happened to him a few years prior in the mid to late 90s. His uncle had just passed away, and he had been a well-known man in the area where they lived. So obviously, on the day of the funeral, the church that held it was extremely crowded, with people from all over town coming to pay respects. But JP would describe the chapel as having several large glass sections in the back 
where people could go stand to watch the services when there were no seats left. This would be what happened on the day of the funeral. JP, on the other hand, was seated up front with his other relatives paying respects to his uncle. But it was about that time he noticed people kept glancing back towards the area where the glass sections were, and he would notice they began to look shocked. So, of course, he wanted to know what was going on, and he turned around to look as well. And what hit him next was one of the eeriest feelings he would ever have, because on the other side of the glass, standing and watching the funeral, was a man who looked just like his uncle, so much so that he could pass for his twin. And now that man was being stared at by everyone in the church. He was the same height, body size, same shape of face, same haircut, same glasses, same everything. JP would go on to say he had no idea who this man was, nor did his family. Actually, we would find out later on that the entire church did not know this person. Now the family, who had been grieving, were anxious to go meet this man after the service, which they did, and they had plenty of questions. This man would tell them that apparently he and his uncle had drank coffee together for years at a restaurant on the way to work. He even said that the people at the cafe thought they were twins for the longest time. JP would close his account by saying although he had his explanation, it was still one of the most unsettling experiences he ever had. And even afterwards, he would run into the guy a few more times and got a strange feeling every time upon seeing him. So we're left with one theory, the doppelganger theory. And this one is actually not fiction. Scientists have been studying this for a while now, and it's believed that everyone has at least six different people that look just like them, so much so that they could pass for twins. There's even a website now called twinstrangers.net where people upload selfies and it matches you up with your doppelganger, assuming they have uploaded as well. And maybe unsurprisingly, further tests have shown that these so-called doppelgangers share more genes than any randomly tested two people. Additionally, the more the doppelgangers favor each other, the more DNA shared. Of course, the strange part about it in this one is, most of these lookalikes live nowhere near close to each other, like the two men in this story. Of course, for this man to show up to the funeral did make the whole thing very odd to everyone involved, but I'm not sure it's a mystery. This next segment is a little spot I like to call Mystery Roundup, where I take the smaller mysteries that are either already solved or have so little info available that they don't really warrant a full segment. First, we start with the moon cube. This was an obscure mystery from the Chinese rover that was exploring the moon, when at one point he would come across what looked to be a cube-shaped object setting in the distance. Some even described it as a mysterious house. However, further exploration after this revealed that it was actually just a small lumpy rock sitting on a crater rim. Next, we have the 2016 Clown Sightings Was a It promotion. I actually discussed the 2016 Clown Sightings way back in the first episode of the Mega Series, but we did not discuss this theory. However, it's pretty much already been debunked for several reasons. For one, basically everyone affiliated with the movie denied anything to do with it. That includes author Stephen King, but I can hear you now saying of course they would distance themselves from it. But considering the risk and potential negative outcomes that could have happened, it's almost certain that Universal, or any film studio, would avoid pulling off something like that. Furthermore, the clown sightings began a year before the movie was even set to come out, making it less likely. However, some still contend that the original sightings were started by people employed by the studio, and then it spiraled out of control, with people taking it up on themselves to go do it too. Now let's get back to the show. Our next one comes from the Belief Ho podcast, where, on a Halloween episode, listeners would send in their own weird Halloween experiences. One listener would contact the podcast about an event from the early 2000s she had witnessed. She would tell that her aunt was hosting a Halloween party for the family, for which eight adults and four kids would attend. And this young girl, telling the story, was nine years old at the time, and she would go to the party with her immediate family, where they then sat on the porch eating candy, as well as giving some out to the trick-or-treaters. Around 9.30 p.m., the night began to wind down, and the trick-or-treaters 
all went home. So the family would call it a night and move inside, where they then sat and relaxed and in general, just enjoyed time with each other. Around 10 p.m., after sitting around the kitchen and chatting for a bit, the family would begin to wrap things up to leave when they suddenly heard the front door begin to creak open. They would all turn around to look at the front door, but didn't see anything. And after waiting a few seconds, they began to chat again until they got a strange feeling that someone was staring at them. So they turned back around to look into the hallway and they seen something unbelievable. Standing there staring at them was a big gorilla, around six foot four in height. The family were stunned and didn't know what to do when one of them finally spoke up to what they assumed was a man in a Halloween costume. They would ask him, can I help you? Who are you? But the person did not reply. Her aunt would get closer and the man still did not move. And in fact, he was barely breathing. All they could see of him was his eyes behind the gorilla mask. Her aunt would ask, would you like some candy? But he continued to ignore them and it led to obviously an awkward situation. None of the adults knew him and there was no vehicle in the driveway that this man would have presumably driven. At this point, the uncle had enough and stood up from the table and said, who are you? But the man in the gorilla suit just continued to stare. This is when panic would set in for the family. But the man in the gorilla suit would then calmly walk through the home before turning back around to look at the startled family and then exited out the door and into the night. Her uncle would then walk out after him in pursuit, only to find that he had vanished. The family would never figure out who this man was and where he came from. That was a creepy one, and there's only a couple of theories. Of course, the podcasters talked about the possibility of a man in a suit just wandering into the home as a Halloween prank, but pointed out the danger in that, since in America, that could very well lead to the intruder being shot. Kinda piggybacking on that theory, is the thought that the person was mentally ill and just wandered in and back out. Or perhaps he was on drugs and was tripping out and just wandered into the home before wandering back out. And finally, the person that emailed the story in could just be making the whole thing up. This is a funny one that I have covered before. In early June of 2022, the Amarillo Zoo would release a picture captured from a security camera in the early morning hours of May 21st, 2022. The picture, well, it is pretty bizarre, which you can see here, has never been explained. The creature showed up at around 1.25 a.m. and was just outside the perimeter fence of the zoo. There have been many theories to try and explain it, one being that it was a large coyote on its hind legs. Others have stated a person with a strange hat or costume walking around. There's also the suggestion that it's the alleged chupacabra which is seen throughout the southwest, while others have suggested aliens or a skinwalker or werewolf. However, one of the more plausible theories is that the city of Amarillo, along with the zoo, tried to pull a hoax on the nation to bring more attention to the city, maybe even tourists who want to go in search of the creature. However, the city has maintained that it is indeed a real image and that nothing was hoaxed. Over the history of the channel, we have looked at numerous missing person cases, but I don't think we have ever looked at a missing town before. But that's exactly what Dublin, Wisconsin is. Dublin was a small rural town in the state of Wisconsin and where exactly is unknown. But it allegedly disappeared sometime in the late 80s or early 90s. It has never been found on maps and it seems to have been scrubbed from history with no one being really sure what happened or where it went or if it ever existed. And if you ask people in Wisconsin, the vast majority don't even remember it. But this mystery has an easy answer. Dublin is a myth, or at least most likely it is. The real mystery is where did this myth originate? That question does not have an easy answer. Some of the earlier posts online that came from 2017 would claim that Dublin just up and vanished into the air one day, taking every resident with it, and allegedly, there is still tourist memorabilia from the town floating around the country, which includes t-shirts, mugs, and postcards. Although, every other trace of it has been erased by the powers that be 
to cover it up. Now while the original telling would also conclude he was most likely an internet legend, some speculated that the families just up and left due to the poor economy or a government project that went wrong or that even the town fell into another dimension. And while those are the more crazier theories, there have been towns that disappeared, which has opened the door for some to speculate that Dublin was real. Some commentators online that discuss it have stated that growing up in Wisconsin, they distinctly remember relatives wearing t-shirts from a bar in Dublin. There's also a photo that recently popped up online, which allegedly comes from a small diner that was said to be located there. But the story would get more suspicious when other posters chimed in, claiming that it was mostly populated by military personnel and their families. The town was allegedly connected to a Project Sanguine, a U.S. Navy proposed project in 1968 that would have seen a giant antenna built that would cover two-fifths of Wisconsin and would be used to send messages to nuclear submarines and supposedly could withstand a nuclear attack. Of course, the project was scratched, which allegedly led to the town being tore down overnight, although that don't really track with the timeline that it disappeared in the late 80s. There's also the fact that the proposed locations for Dublin wouldn't have even worked with Project Sanguine because of the bedrock. Others insist that Dublin was actually destroyed after a flood during the construction of Project Sanguine, either accidentally or on purpose. But considering that the project never even got into the construction phase, that rules that theory out too. One weird issue with this whole thing, and might actually be the real culprit behind Dublin, is some flawed Google search results. Up until the past year or so, if you type Dublin, Wisconsin into Google, you would be brought back a result on the first page from a Wisconsin newspaper called Post Crescent. And in that link was a 2015 article which documented more than 1,000 missing Wisconsin residents. Of course, the article was just taking a casual look into missing people in general, but it is strange that the Dublin, Wisconsin search term brought that specific article up, although Google search engine can definitely be flawed. But it does make the whole mystery even more confusing because the real first documented occurrence of Dublin online came in 2017 on 4chan and Tumblr specifically. So what exactly is Dublin? In all likelihood, just an internet legend. Although, it could have been a small town that became a ghost town and was then destroyed. But this would have most likely been recorded. But then again, maybe, just maybe, this was the result of some kind of unexplained phenomenon. Minecraft is a game I don't have to go into much details about. It's the best-selling video game in history, with over 300 million copies sold. And even in being a decade old, still has more than 140 million monthly active players. And it's this game that our next little-known mystery comes from. Because in Minecraft, your username has to be unique. Meaning, if someone holds any given name in the game, that's it, it's taken. And there's no new users who can register to match your account name. Nor can an already registered user change their name to match yours. Which would make it a little strange in 2015 when the username DAKA spelled capital D, lowercase a, capital Q, lowercase a, would show up online and was then shared by at least 72 different accounts. According to the Reddit post, which brought us this mystery, there are only two ways to have multiple accounts with the same name. In the rare occasion where two or more users type in the same name at the same time, those accounts are accepted. Of course, this would be a fairly common name and not uncommon names like Daka. The other way is if the original account is deleted from the database, either accidentally or intentionally, and then a new user requests that name, but the old user has the account re-enabled, leading to two accounts sharing the same name. But again, neither of these explain how there were 72 different accounts using the name Daka. There were suggestions that it stood for developer account slash quality assurance. But there was one thing that kind of ruled that out. Another username called Increased had 37 duplicates, and that name doesn't seem like a reference to a developer account. In either case, the names were created between 2015 and 16. I'm not a player of Minecraft, so I can't really elaborate much on it. But the top theory is that Daka 
was in fact a developer account, while the increased account could be developer or tester with an increased level of access within the game. Regardless, it wasn't long after this anomaly was brought to the internet that the 72 accounts were purged from the game. Alright all, this actually wraps up the second layer of this iceberg, so this is probably a good a stopping spot as any. I hope you enjoyed. Goodbye, and good night.